41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I just want to bring to your attention, just want to take out of that straight away, is that those that gladly received the word were baptized. Okay, baptism is a th something that we ought to be glad about, something that we ought to rejoice about. These people that heard the gospel were glad to be saved, were rejoicing, and then what did they do? They were baptized. One of the things you're going to notice immediately from the scriptures is that as soon as someone is saved, they are baptized, right? And, and, and it should be a time of, of glad rejoicing, a time, you know, that this is why I wanted to get out here today to celebrate the baptisms that are going to be done. We want to rejoice. We want to be glad with the people getting baptized. And it ought to be a time of rejoicing. The rain's not going to let us down. The rain's not going to put a damper on the day. We're going to be glad as we see the baptisms take place. Okay? But some of the things I just want to point out is the question is, where did baptisms begin? Right? What was the origin of baptism? Because we don't see baptisms in the Old Testament. Okay? Obviously, in the New Testament, John chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, it says, There was a man sent from God. Okay? We're talking about John the Baptist here. A man sent from God. Why was he known as John the Baptist? Because he was the first to start the baptism. You know, he started to baptize people. He was known as the Baptist. And the reason why we're a Baptist church, by the way, is because we continue that same practice that we saw from John the Baptist. We're a Baptist church because we baptize people. Okay, but he was sent by God. This isn't something he just decided to do. This was something that God had for his ministry sent by God. And then in John chapter 1, verse 32 to 33, it says, this is after John the Baptist baptized Jesus. It says here that John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, speaking about Jesus, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. Okay, so not only was John sent for a ministry, but he was sent by the Father to baptize with water. That was his task. That was his job. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So in the baptism of Jesus, we see the Trinity take place there. We see Jesus going into the water. We see the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And we see even the Father having spoken to John the Baptist and says, Hey, the one that you see that, you know, that, that the Spirit descend upon, that's the one that I've sent. That's the, that's the Messiah. And it was John the Baptist's job not just to baptize um, believers, but surprising to him, he was to baptize Jesus Christ. And so, obviously, you know, those that teach that baptism is required for salvation, it's, it's, or, or to wash away your sins, immediately just the fact that Jesus was baptized shows you that baptism does not wash away sins because Jesus had no sins to be washed of. Right? But Jesus Christ came. Remember, He came as a man. He came to set an example for us. Okay? And so we ought to follow in His steps. We ought to follow in His steps. And so Jesus came showing us the example of baptism in obedience to the Father. Okay? And also to, uh, to, uh, to just, uh, justify is probably the wrong word, but I'll just say that to justify the ministry of John the Baptist because that was the occasion that John was waiting for. Was wait, he was baptizing all these thousands of people at the river, but he was waiting for the Messiah to come to be baptized. To ba to be baptized. So what does baptism represent? Okay? Obviously, we're here at the lake because, because we're not just going to sprinkle someone. We're getting sprinkled right now in the rain. That's not why we've come here. Okay? But what does baptism represent? Obviously, we dunk someone into the water. We immerse them into the water. What does that represent? Romans 6, chapter 1 to 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, just because we're saved and it's not by cleaning up our life, just because we're saved and it's not by repenting of our sins, does that mean we should continue sinning? The Bible says, you know, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ we're baptized into his death. Okay? So baptism is, an, is a representation or is an image of being baptized into his death. Okay? Therefore we are buried by him with bapti uh, baptism into his death, 
the like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so baptism just does uh, represent his death, but it represents his resurrection, okay? And his resurrection, that, uh, that likeness is also as we ought to walk in newness of life. Okay, so not only are we identifying with the death and resurrection of Christ, but when we are uh, baptized, and that's the first step of obedience. Okay, in the scriptures we'll see that people got baptized immediately after they were saved because it's that first step of obedience. It's that first step of wa walking in newness of life. Okay, so yes, it represents the death, burial, and resurrection, but it represents, hey, I'm going to walk in the newness of life. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to do what I can to follow the Lord and obey His commandments. Then it says in verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay? So the moment you're saved is the moment that your body of sin was destroyed. Okay? As far as God is concerned, that body has been destroyed the moment we're sinned because we have the new man, we've been regenerated, we've been born of the Spirit, we're a new creature. Okay? But when we do the baptism, we are just publicly demonstrating that that has already taken place in our life. Okay, so just those two things. What does baptism represent? Number one, it represents a public identification, identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But number two, it represents that first step of obedience, walking in newness of life, publicly showing the church, hey, I'm going to strive to walk in the Lord. I'm going to strive to grow in the Lord. I'm going to strive to learn more, to have the wisdom of God that's found in the Bible. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. So it's those two things that baptism represents. Now, what about the method of baptism? Method of how should we baptize? Okay, what is the correct way? Well, we spoke. We already mentioned that baptism is a picture of the burial, right? So that should immediately tell you how baptism should take place. Okay, but just for further clarification, in Colossians chapter two, verse twelve, the Bible says, "Buried with him in baptism." So the baptism is a burial. Okay, buried with him in baptism wherein also you were risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who have raised him from the dead. Okay, so always pay attention to those. Being buried, being raised. That's what baptism represents. And so immediately it should come to mind that those that pour or those that sprinkle usually little children, and that's what, that's what they call baptism, you immediately just know that's incorrect, right? Because how do we bury people? When someone passes away, we put them in the grave. What are we doing? We're, we're burying them in the dirt. We're burying them in the earth, are we not? Their whole body is going into, the, into that earth. Jesus Christ in his grave, the stone was covered. Okay, his whole body was covered when he was buried, when Jesus Christ was buried. Okay, so baptism ought to represent a burial. Okay, so in what way does pouring or sprinkling represent burial? It doesn't, right? When you've got a body and it gets buried, do we just sprinkle dirt on it and done? That's it, we're done? You know, do we just pour a little bit of dirt on top of that body and we're done? No, that body's completely immersed six feet under, normally if you have the traditional uh, burial in the cemetery. And that's what baptism ought to represent. The water represents the dirt or the earth. And so your whole body should be covered completely and brought back up out of that dirt. So that's the, that's the method of baptism. Um, another one here in Matthew 3.13, the Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it be so now, for thus becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, pay attention to those words, and went up straightway out of the water. So where was Jesus Christ when he was baptized? If he came out of the water, that would mean he was in the water, right? He was in the water. They didn't just come to the lake, to the shore, and just sprinkle a little bit of water on Jesus Christ. He was in the water, which meant he had to come out of the water, okay? And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. 
And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So again, the fact that He came out of the water represents, means that He was in the water, and you don't need to go into the water to be sprinkled. Okay, you don't need to go into the water just to be a little bit poured. You can do that anywhere. Any little bit of water will satisfy those things. So the fact that they went into the water will only make logical sense if they were completely immersed into the water. Okay? John 3.23 And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. So the Bible tells us there's a reason why John went to this, la to this river because there was much water water there okay get that into your mind there was much water there and that's why we've come here because there's much water here okay if you're going to sprinkle someone you're going to pour water upon them you don't need much water okay you just need a cup of water you need a little, little bit of water so it only makes sense again if you go going to immerse someone in baptism you need a place of much water to do it okay and so it should be so obvious and I said this in my very first sermon on our first day, of our first Sunday, is that even in the Greek, you know, that word baptizo means immersion. Okay? The Greeks who read the New Testament in the original language, they knew what it meant. Okay? And that's why the Roman Catholic Church had that split with the Greek Orthodox Church. One of the issues being over the topic of baptism. Because they knew what they were doing were wrong, sprinkling children. But again, they, they still got it wrong because they're immersing children. And... Um, and by the way, another thing they do wrong is when they immerse children. I don't know if you know this, but they do it like three times. They do it like they do it once, twice, and three times. And the way they think about it is, well, you know, I'm baptized in the name of the, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? But what does baptism represent? It represents the burial, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. How many times did Jesus die? Three times? <laughs> no, just once, right? So you just do the baptism once and you're done with. Okay, so... While the Greek Orthodox kind of got it right that it's immersion, they, they still messed it up. They're doing it three times and they still messed it up. It's not for children, but we'll go into that shortly. Well, it's not for babies, I should say. We'll go into that shortly. Um, so, the next question is, well, when should we be baptized? When is the best time to be baptized? And the answer is immediately or as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Acts 8.36 And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So this eunuch, if you know the story, met with Philip, and he had questions about the Bible. He didn't understand what he was reading. Philip explained the gospel to him. He, under, he must have explained baptism. Otherwise, this eunuch would be asking, what's the, you know, wouldn't be asking about baptism, right? Because it's, it's not in the Old Testament. He was reading the Old Testament. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So first of all, what's the gospel? If thou believest, it's faith on Christ. And if you do that, thou mayest. Okay? You're allowed to be baptized once you believe on Christ. Once you've put your faith on Christ. That's the only criteria of baptism. Someone that's saved, someone that's believed on Christ, is eligible for biblical baptism. Okay? They don't need to go through a 12-week course on the fundamentals of the faith. All they need to know is salvation by grace through faith and not of works. That's all they need to know. They don't need to go through, you know, uh, be, uh, their life ought to be analyzed. Okay? Because, remember, what does baptism represent? It represents the newness of life. And what I find sometimes, some pastors will say, well, I'm not going to baptize this person until I see a pattern of good works in their life. But hold on, baptism is the first step, all right, of the newness of life. So why are you asking something from them when they haven't done step number one, right? It's ridiculous. And then uh, the other criteria is that some people say, well, if children get baptized, you'll see some pastors say, well, I won't baptize them until they're a certain age. You know, if they're 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever age they have. But that's in disobedience to the script. I'll get into that later on. But what we see in scriptures is that as soon as someone believes, they are baptized. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
He didn't say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Father. Right? He didn't say, Jesus Christ is the Spirit. No, he said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Again, if it's sprinkling, why would you need to go into the water? Okay? We go into the water because it represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And again, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, my preferred method of baptism, not just the immersion, but is going backwards. Because when you bury someone, you bury them on their back, right? So it's, it's backwards. So, you know, first of all, when you stand up, that's the crucifixion. Christ was crucified on the cross. That's when you're standing in the water. Then when you're buried, you're going back, buried, right? And then raised in his resurrection, back up again, okay? Now, if you've been baptized and, you know, I think Alistair was telling me, he knew someone that, was, got, that got baptized like head first, like that way. I mean, look, as long as, you know, he was immersed, I, I don't, I'm not saying that's an invalid baptism. It's, it's, it's unusual. It's strange. But I wouldn't go head first. I mean, <laughs> what if you give him concussion? Like, you don't go head first like that. Um, some people might have been baptized just by, uh, like, kneeling into the water, you know, and, and having their head completely covered and they're brought up. Again, I don't think any of that's invalid. As long as you're being baptized by immersion and you're a believer, that's fine. Some people do that, like, some people kind of do that kneeling and down. If they don't have a lot of water, they might like have a bathtub or something. So they don't have the room to put a whole body backward and, and back. So, you know, it's fine as long as you're being immersed the same way that a burial immerses that dead body. Um, but yeah, we're talking about being baptized as soon as possible or immediately. Acts 16 verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If we have judged me to the faithful, uh, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So we see this example of Lydia in Thyatira, when she heard the preaching of Paul, when she, you know, she was already um, someone that uh, worshipped God. I believe she was really saved as far as the Old Testament. She probably didn't know yet of Jesus Christ. But she came, Paul came preaching Jesus Christ. And of course, those that were saved in the Old Testament would have automatically received Christ as Savior, right? Because they were already saved under the Old Testament uh, way, which was still looking at Christ. But when she heard that, heard about baptism, she was baptized immediately. We see that, okay? Acts 18 verse 7 <coughs> And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God. Again, this is another person that worshipped God like Lydia did. I believe this person was already saved, but he worshipped God whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, oh, sorry, this is now talking about Crispus. We're talking about a different person. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Okay, so they believe, they hear the word of God, they trust Jesus as a savior, and they're baptized. Okay, now uh, also this takes place, another one in Acts 8.12 in Samaria. It says, and when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Okay, both men and women. So baptism is for everybody. Male and female, man and woman. And by the way, one of the reasons why uh, some of the Protestant churches and maybe the you know, Catholics and all that, one of the reasons they baptize children or baptize babies, I should say, is because they liken it to circumcision. And if you remember in the Old Testament, uh, on the eighth day, if you were a male uh, Hebrew child, you'd be uh, circumcised. And so they have this idea that baptism represents circumcision Whereas in the Bible, baptism actually represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, right? So that's why they, they baptized babies. But who were circumcised? Were, was, it the, was, it just the, the, was it the boys and the girls? No, circumcision was just for the boys, right? So if it pictures circumcision in that sense, then only men would be baptized. Do you see that? But the thing that, you know, that I want to take out of here is that baptism 
is for men and women because it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which is for all. Jesus Christ did that for the whole world. And so baptism is for everybody as long as you have believed on Christ. And of course, there's Acts 16, one of our favorites, verse 30 to 33, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, be baptized. No, baptism is not required for salvation. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and, and to all that were in the house. Okay. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his straight way. So here's an example um, of being baptized the same hour. <laughs> the same hour they believed. The same hour they heard the gospel preached. Not just the uh, Philippian jailer, but his whole house believed on Christ and were baptized that same hour. Now this was at night, so I don't know where, you know, the same hour of the night. I don't know if they, they just, they found a lake. I mean, Dorothy, if you're concerned about being cold, it'd be much colder if it was like nighttime. But we see that taking place even, even in the New Testament. They were baptized in the same hour of the night. So, you know, I, I was saved. I think I told you guys I was saved when I was four. But I got baptized when I was, I think I was 21. Okay, I was in really early 20s. I can't remember exact how old I was. I was 20 or 21. So that's like 16 or 17 years after being saved. And the reason, the reason, it just wasn't, ex baptism was not explained well to me. I didn't really understand what it meant. I, I was saved and I was at a Baptist Union church. And as you know, a lot of these churches don't teach like the meat of the word. It's very vague, very shallow. You don't really learn anything, you know. Um, but I was afraid that if I got baptized, I was afraid if I got baptized that God was going to send me as a missionary in the middle of Africa. And that's why I didn't get baptized. You know, my parents would, say, would be asking, oh, you know, are you ready to get baptized? I'm like, nah, I don't want to go to Africa. I don't, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go, you know, uh, you know, who knows, die of hunger, get eaten by a lion, get, get killed by the tr tribal people. That's what I was thinking, right? I was thinking God's going to send me to Africa when all this time he was sending me to the Sunshine Coast. You know, I mean, there was no need to delay it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, that, that's wrong. We should be baptized immediately. And to be honest with you, because it represents that newness of life, I really didn't start growing. I didn't mature much as a believer until I got baptized. It wasn't until I got baptized where I really started to learn and grow um, in the Lord. Not that I didn't grow before, but it was just a very slow process. It wasn't until I got baptized and got serious where my growth started to, you know, take off as a Christian. Um, yeah, and I, and I mentioned about how children can be delayed sometimes because people want to say, well, so there's some concern, well, you know, I don't want to baptize children because what if they're not really saved? You know, what if, what if, what if because, you know, it should follow salvation. But again, how hard is salvation? It's, it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So there's some concern by pastors out there that I don't want to baptize children. I'll wait till they're old enough, like the 12, where they can really understand, where I can have assurance that they really understood the gospel. You know, I've had an opportunity to see them grow in the Lord. Then I'll baptize them. And they've got this fear of someone being baptized by accident. But we see in the scriptures, there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to be fearful of, you know. Um, in, in the book of Acts 19, Acts 19, verse 2 to 5, um, we have Paul journeying and he's, he comes across these disciples and he asks the question, it says here in verse number 2, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So these guys weren't even saved. They're like, you know, Paul's asking, that, you know, have you received the Holy Ghost since you've been saved? Since you've believed? And they're like, we haven't even heard. Like, we don't even know, we don't even know what you're talking about. What's this Holy Ghost? And he said unto them, Unto then were ye, unto then what, uh, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto him, Unto John's baptism. So these disciples were baptized by John the Baptist, okay? Now, John the Baptist was baptized in th thousands. Thousands of people were coming to him, and he was baptized in thousands. So it's no surprise that amongst those thousands, there are some of those that 
did it out of, you know, out of uh, just, oh, everyone else, is, everyone else is getting baptized. Let's get baptized as well. You know, maybe they thought it had some special spiritual power upon them. They didn't realize that they had to believe on Christ and be baptized. And then in verse 4, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So it sounds to me, they weren't even that familiar with Jesus Christ. Maybe they've heard of him, but they didn't recognize that the baptism represented the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They didn't have a full understanding of what that baptism represented. And so John said, hey, you've got to believe on him. They do, and then they're baptized again. Okay? So what we learn from this, and I believe God gives us these little stories there just to answer some of these, you know, um, heresies that get taught, you know, just the things people believe falsely. It's like God always has a little story there, you know, to, to, uh, to clarify the misunderstanding. But let's say hypothetically a child, you know, we believe they're saved, they get baptized, and then later on we find out they really weren't saved. Well, nothing to be worried about, you know. They just get baptized again when they are saved, that's all. The first time they just got a little wet. They got wet, they, they, got, they had a little swim in the river, they had a little swim in the lake. That's it. They get saved, they get baptized again. What's the big deal? Hey, at least do things, you know, scripturally. We see people get baptized immediately. We should encourage people to get baptized as soon as possible. Don't delay that. That's unbiblical because you're trying to fit something in your mind. You're trying to justify something, but just do it by faith. If that person says, I've believed on Christ, then baptize them. If you later on you find out they weren't saved, well, baptize them after they get saved. Big deal, you know? I'm not concerned about them getting baptized, you know, a second time. I'm more concerned as why they believed they were saved before, you know, when they got baptized. I'd be more concerned about that. You know, why, you know, did they hear a false gospel being taught? Why did they believe incorrectly? I'd be more concerned about that because that's what their salvation is based on. You know, salvation is not based on whether you get dunked in the water or not. Okay. So there's no fear in baptizing children. Okay, there shouldn't be any reason to delay baptism more than required. The next point I want to bring up is that baptism is not a requirement. And I've already mentioned this a couple of times, but it's not a requirement for salvation. Now, the first reason for that, um, just very easily, we've got over a hundred Bible verses that it's by faith alone. You know, we've got so many scriptures. John 3.16, for, for God to love the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So, eternal life is received through faith. Okay, we have over a hundred verses in the Bible. You know, if baptism was a requirement for salvation, then all these verses would be a lie. You know, God is a God that cannot lie. Okay? We have a book full of Bible verses by faith alone on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. If anything else was required for salvation, then all those verses would be a lie. Okay? But we know those verses aren't a lie because God cannot lie. Okay? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Ephesians 2 8, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith. You know, it's not for by grace are you saved through baptism and faith. You know, it's by faith. And what about John, you know, John 6 47, Jesus says, Verily, verily, what does that mean? Truly, truly. You know, I'm not lying to you, says Jesus. I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth. I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, if baptism was required for salvation, can Jesus say verily, verily? Can he say truly, truly? No, that would make Jesus a liar. Okay, and Jesus is not just telling us the truth, but he is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, says Jesus Christ. Okay, so just immediately, just all the verses that it's by faith alone, all of that reinforces the fact that baptism is not a requirement for salvation. But some of the verses that people use to teach 
uh, baptismal, baptismal regeneration or salvation through baptism. One of them is, is Acts chapter 2, and we had, that, we had Callum read that for us before. In verse 37 to 38, it says, Now when they heard this, remember the preaching that was being had to the, to the Jews. And when they heard this, when the Jews heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a really good question. What shall we do? Okay. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, it's a good question. What shall we do? I'm glad they asked that question. They were pricked in their hearts. They realized they crucified their Messiah. And now they're like, what do we do? We've, you know, we, we've killed the one that God sent to save us. What do we do? What shall we do is the question. Now, before I answer that one, um, uh, Matthew, you might remember this, we were out soul winning. And I brought up Acts 16, verse 30 to 31, of course, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So the question in Acts 16, I was preaching this door to door with Matthew to this uh, uh, Pentecostal guy. And I got to Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes, yeah, but that's not enough. What about the other question? Just like it, you know, in Acts 2, what shall we do? That's what we're talking about. What shall we do? And I had to point out to him, but hold on. Acts 16 is what must I do to be saved? Whereas in Acts 2, it's just, what shall we do, right? There are two very different questions, though they might cover some of the similar topics. Like, you know, think about it like this. If my kids woke up in the morning and said, Dad, Dad, what must I do? Because they're homeschooled. What must I do for school? And I'll be like, well, not me, but Christina will be like, well, you know, you got your math, you got your English, you got your history. You must do those today, right before you can go out and play. Okay, that's what you must do to the school. But what if the kids woke up in the morning and said, you know, Mom, Dad, what shall we do? Okay, is that a specific question? No, it's a very broad, it's a very open question. What shall we do? I'll be like, kids, read your Bible. Do your, you know, we're getting to do, uh, summarize every chapter of the Bible they read. You know, have your breakfast, brush your teeth, do your homeschooling. Do your chores. I'm glad you're asking that question, kids. And I'll give you everything that you should do. Obey your parents, okay? But you can see how that's a very broad question. It's a very good question, but it's a very broad question. It's not a specific question. Whereas in Acts 16, very specifically, what must I do to be saved? Okay? So what is salvation? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, if someone came to me and said, you know, as a Christian or as a new believer or someone that, you know, wants to be saved and ask the question, what shall we do? I'd answer all these things as well. Hey, you know, believe, repent, turn from your unbelief, believe on Christ. Yeah, be baptized, read your Bibles, go to church, pray, confess your sins to the Lord. You know, uh, what more? You know, what shall we do is a broad question. Lots of things. But are all those things required for salvation? No, right? The only one is to repent. Turn from your unbelief and believe on Christ. So these people that use this verse to teach baptism as a requirement for salvation are taking a very broad question and applying it to a very specific question, whereas that answer is in Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the, the other thing I'll say, well, hold on. It says here in Acts 2, verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent, so that's turning from your unbelief, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Christ, of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So they say, well, see, to have your sins remitted of, to have your sins removed from you, you have to be baptized for the remission of sins. See? But here's the thing. In English, the word for can be used in two different ways. The first way is a preposition, okay? A preposition for, for the purpose of. That's a preposition, for the purpose of. So if you read the for here in that preposition um, 
a, 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 a way of understanding this word for, then yes, that would be saying that to have your sins remitted of, you need to get baptized. You know, you need to get baptized to have your sins taken, taken away for, taken away from. Because that's the purpose of it. The purpose of having uh, uh, baptism is to get rid of your sins. But for can also be used as a conjunction. Okay? For God so loved the world. That's a conjunction. It's joining something that was there before. That's because of. Because of. And so, if we use for in the conjunction way of, of reading it, it will say, Be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ because of the remission of sins. Because you've repented, because you've believed on Christ, because you're saved, because your sins have been remitted of, then get baptized. Okay? So it's the way you read the four. And you say, well, how do we know which one it is, Kevin? Do we just take your word for it? That it's the conjunction for and not the preposition for? Well, no, because we just compare Scripture with Scriptures, right? Acts 10.43 says, to him, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So how do we receive remission of sins? Whosoever believeth in him, not whosoever is baptized. So we know when we go back to Acts chapter 2, to have the remission of sins is a uh, conjunction because of. They believed, they've had the sins remitted of, and because of that, they can be baptized. Okay, so they take that passage, they take those words out of context and out of the, the right grammar that it should be read in. But the other one they turn to is, is uh, Mark chapter 16. Mark 16 verse 15 to 16. And he said unto them, Go into all the world. This is uh, another part, this is another uh, passage about the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned and as I see in verse 16 it says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and they think we have a problem with that I don't have a problem with that I believe and I've been baptized I'm saved right many of you have believed and have been baptized and are saved we're not saying that baptism takes away your salvation of course not of course not. He pictures what you've believed, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But the second part is what clarifies it for us. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So what damns you to hell? Believing not. Okay? So what's going to give you eternal life? Believing. Okay? And if you get baptized, guess what? You're still saved. It's true. You know, you could say, he that believeth and goes to church shall be saved. He that believeth and reads his Bible shall be saved. He that believeth and sits down on cardboard boxes shall be saved. Of course, because it's the belief that saves you. Okay? But if you believe not, then that will be what damns you. Okay? So please, don't get tricked into these people trying to take these passages and making it seem like they've got one up you. You know, but it's easily explained. And we believe that if you're baptized, of course you're saved. Why would we think you lose your salvation after baptism? You know? But just to reinforce that uh, baptism is not a requirement. Thank God for the sun. <laughs> thank God for the sun. But just to reinforce, and the best one to turn to is 1 Corinthians. I'll get you to turn there if you've got your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. It's a little bit hard with the wind. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, it reads, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren. So Paul is writing here to the brethren, to the church in Corinthians. Okay? Now this is, this is such a bad church. You know, if, 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 some of these church, if some of these IFB churches had the attitude they have back then, they'll say these people are definitely not saved. But I just want you to realize that Paul calls them my brethren. Okay, because he knows they have believed the gospel. For it have been declared unto you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Okay, so this church has contentions. 
Don't be surprised when there's contention. Don't be surprised when there's arguments. In fact, it's probably a good thing sometimes because people that are zealous and passionate, guess what? They're going to get into arguments from time to time. It's okay. Okay, contention happens. Okay, but we shouldn't stay arguing and fighting. We should always bring, try to uh, uh, bring peace among brethren. Anyway, that's not my point. But there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you that say, if I'm of Paul and I of Apollos and I of Cephas and I of Christ. So we have some in the church saying, hey, I belong. I, I, I align myself with the teachings of Paul. I'm of Paul. I'm of Christ. You know, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. And by the way, all these people, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, I believe that's referring to Peter. All of these guys are great men of God. You know, it's not like they're following some false prophet. They're actually following and listening to great men of God. And then some say, well, I'm of Christ. It's like, oh, you're following a man. I'm following Christ. You know, like I'm, I'm more holy than you are, kind of this idea. But all these men are there to set an example in the church anyway. You know, verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You know, who am I? Did I die for you? You know, were you baptized in my name? No, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then he says in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you. <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, Paul, I'm like, oh, thank God I have nothing to do with you. I didn't even baptize you. You know, I, I, you know, it's like Paul's just tired of this contention he's fighting. You know, he realizes he's just a man. Why? Why do you put me up so high in a pedestal? I'm so glad I didn't do any of that. You know, but Crispus and Gaius. So he, he baptized none of them except Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I have baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. So he goes like, I baptized Crispus, Gaius. Um, the household of Stephanus, who knows how many that are, maybe less than 10 people. In his whole ministry, maybe Paul's baptized less than 10 people. Okay, He had other people doing the baptizing for him. Uh, and then in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize. Okay, Is baptism a requirement of salvation? Is baptism part of the gospel? For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. How can he, if, if baptism is part of the gospel, and remember, Matthew, that same guy we're talking about, when, when he asked me, well, that's, that, is that all the gospel is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? He goes, no, you got more, that's baptism. No! He, I should have turned, yeah, I should have turned, I didn't, I didn't think about it. But for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So baptism is not preaching the gospel. Baptism is something that comes after you've preached the gospel, after someone's believed the gospel. It's not part of the gospel message. It's not part of your salvation. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Okay? So, um, what I take out of that, I'm not sure if this is the correct interpretation, but what I take out of that is if you have baptism as part of the gospel, as part of salvation, then the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Then it hasn't had, you know, you haven't been saved if you're putting baptism, because that's, that's just a work, you know, that you ought to do. So you, again, you're adding kind of works or you're adding a, uh, 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 um, a practice to salvation rather than just faith alone. Okay. Now, if someone says, well, hold on, you know, the gospel, that's not salvation. You know, you need more than the gospel to be saved. But what does Romans 1.16 say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So salvation, the power of salvation is through the gospel to everyone that is baptized. No, not baptized. To everyone that believeth. Right? very clearly taught in the scriptures and the best example the one i love the most and this one this is the one i always use for those that are teaching works or those that are teaching baptism for salvation is obviously the thief on the cross i've already read this one in a previous sermon but luke 23 42 and he said unto jesus lord 
Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Truly I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Right? Now this thief on the cross, all he did was put his faith on Christ. Lord, remember me. And Jesus says, Verily, truly, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Beautiful words. You know, what a way to go into your death, you know, hearing those words. Amazing. Like he would have been just moments away from dying and going to hell and his eternal destiny changed like that. You know, he couldn't do works. He couldn't get baptized. Just faith on Christ. Promise to be in paradise with Jesus Christ. What an amazing promise. Um, I did have a couple of other things, but I think I'll leave it there. Um, thank you for being patient. And thank you for, you know, um, putting up with the weather. I think, you know, God's come through for us. So uh, 